I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, there is a new book out there, a memoir that you won't want to put down. It is as lyrically written as the song lyrics that start each chapter. It is called Destiny Lives on Fairhaven Street, a father's memoir of first love, sacrifice, and perseverance. It is written by C.J. Hudson, and we are delighted to have C.J. as a guest today on Spotlight. C.J., thank you so much for joining us here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. My pleasure. I'm just a kid and my life is a nightmare. Simple plan oh, yeah. starts your first chapter. And I love that song. I love all of the songs you began your chapters with. Tell me a little bit why you decided to have a song at the beginning of each chapter. Well, it was actually something I had been thinking about for a long time, ever since the, the book was just conceptual in, in nature in my head, because songs have always been a huge part of my life, and music in general, as a lot of people. Uh, but it really plays into the my past with my family. What would happen is is that I, I, come, I came from a very abusive family. So what would happen is, is that my mother and my brother, when right before these events would occur, they would always put earphones on my head. So that way I wouldn't hear any of it. So, and of course they would have songs and music playing while whatever was going on. So, and that was something that I, I came to, to get used to is like when I, when, when I needed to get away or when I had a problem with my life, I always put on headphones and I always had music to kind of, you know, guide me and soothe me and everything. And so it just made sense to, to have each chapter be, rep be represented by a song that meant something to me. Absolutely. It's kind of like your shield, your noise blocker. It's kind of your safe space. Now, you do start out with that song, I'm Just a Kid and My Life is a Nightmare. So you did have a tough upbringing, correct? I did. That, that is correct. And, you know, so this is a story of overcoming those obstacles you faced as a young person. Tell the audience a little bit about your memoir and why you wrote it. Well, there's there's a plethora of reasons why I wrote it, but the primary reasons uh, are are my two children, Maximus and Colin, um, because you know the the point of the story was that I ended a hundred years of abuse in our family. Uh, it, it's three generations long, three generations deep, uh, and it was something that you know I'm obviously not going to be on this earth forever, so you know I wanted to make sure that I left something to them because they never had to go through it. Uh, neither did my wife. So it was something that I wanted to make sure they understood, and maybe to a certain extent, to, to a certain extent, they felt because they never had to experience it. All for the sake of making sure that when I go, it never comes back. Um, and it's the most important thing to me. Uh, it was also, you know, written to the first woman I ever loved, you know, because she was she was the main reason for for all this to happen, you know. And then my editor disagrees with me. She she thinks it's more than just Danielle, but you know, Danielle was was a huge part of my life, and and she was the 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 guiding beacon, I guess you could say, is what I've heard other people say. So it was very important that you know I wanted to make sure that the world knew about her, and and my boys knew about our past. Absolutely. Well, you've written a wonderful book, um, and I think it's you know instructional to a lot of people because. So many of us, you know, you and I are roughly the same age. We grew up in an era where parents didn't think twice of slapping you around or hitting you with an electrical cord or right. whatever it is. And their parents yeah. did it and their parents did it, like you said. Um, and to break that cycle of, of, of abuse is important. Absolutely. 100%. And, you know, there was something I, I kind of ran into when I first released the book uh, for review. You know, it, it's chapter two specifically is, is it's not easy to read. It's very graphic. But but as I said before, there's a reason for that, because I want to make sure my kids understand that this was real. This was not something you just heard about. You know, I, I, I heard some of the stories from my grandfather of some of the stuff that my dad would do and some of the stuff he would do to him. And it, it was graphic and they were just very open about it. That's just that was according to him, that was their generation. Right. So that was something that I really wanted to stress. Not only was it the wrong thing to do, but this is, you know, this book is just part one of a series I'm writing to my kids, basically, chronic, you know, uh, telling the story of how they came to be. 
and I wanted to see that, look, your dad was kind of screwed up. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then this is why, you know, but, but it's okay, you know, because it's, you know, we all go through hardships in life, but more, most importantly, above all else, they can be overcome. Yeah. Yeah. I remember my mom saying, spare the rod, spoil the child. And that was told to her from uh, her parents. So, you know, kids did get knocked around, uh, some obviously to much greater degrees than others. Tell me a little bit about your process to rebuilding your life and overcoming this um, hardship. Well, the the process obviously took decades. Uh, This was not something that happened overnight. Um, The biggest thing was building confidence. That was one of the, the, the biggest obstacles I had to overcome. And that's one of the reasons why Danielle was so instrumental to that, because even though she was, we were the same age when we met, we were both 10. Uh, we were together until we were 13. She was the antithesis to my parents. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, my parents would tell me, well, you're worthless, you're this, you're that. And she'd be like, no, you're not. You know, and, and I remember because my mother would tell me, you're going to be just like your dad when you grow up. You're going to be beating women and all this other stuff. And she's like, and, my, and Danielle was like, no, you're not. In fact, I, I believe it so strongly. I want to marry you one day. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and that really struck me. So having her was, was the basis for everything. And then what happened was, is that once, once we separated, it's like, well, wait a second. I, I do deserve to be loved. I do deserve to, to be happy. And it's like, I have this person who told me this, who showed me this. Well, I want to be with her. I don't want to be with anyone else. And I've always been the kind of person I'm very decisive. I know what I want when I see it. And I very rarely alter my course. So over the years, I just, you know, I, I said, I'm going to become the man that she deserves. I'm going to become the man that she always knew that I was, mm. you know. And so I, I did for years. I, you know, learned to defend myself. I grew up, changed my looks. I, I wasn't the best looking kid. Um, you know, for eight years, I didn't date anyone. Mm. I refused to date anyone because I was going to go back and prove myself to this woman. It's like, look, you were right about me all along. And not only were you right about me, my heart is still yours. Um, it's like, I, I, it's not over for me. Um, even though it's, you know, kids are expected to date and everything. I legitimately did not want anyone else because I found my match. Um, so, and then from there, you know, it just, it, it became a habit. I've always, and I mentioned this in the book, I believe it's like, it's, it's all about little victories, little things that, that over time, little things when you're building up your confidence, I didn't realize I could do that before. Oh, wait, I can do that now. Well, what about this little things? Right. And they start to create a snowball effect. And before you know it, you're unstoppable because it's like you you just, you know, you can do anything, you can do everything. And, and I started out as a kid who would quit any little thing, doesn't matter what it was. As soon as it became difficult, I quit. I was done. Drove Danielle's father crazy. He couldn't stand it. So what happened was, is that I'm like, okay, I'm going to work on that. So it's like, well, okay, well, well, what do you, what can you do to show her that you, you've overcome that? Well, I'm not going to date anyone. And it was hard, especially once I changed my looks to start getting attention from women. It became really difficult, right. but I did it. Um, and before you know it, at the end of the book, I'm at, her, I'm at her front door. Here I am. I'm ready. And then that's, that's where the book goes into the ending. Wonderful. It's a wonderful story. And uh, it's wonderful how it comes full circle. And that first love you have, um, I think if you're fortunate enough to have it at that age when you're young, it really is so strong. Um, I remember my first love just saying her name would uh, elate me. Um, So it does have a profound impact and influence on your life. Yep. And I I found the same thing with Danielle. I would see a picture of her and it's just like, you know, I could be in the worst shape ready to quit you know i'm done and then i see her picture and it's just like there's i don't know how to explain it the only way the person will ever understand is if they got bitten by the bug right well the the bug of love so to speak you know if you're bitten by the bug you get it because because it's like it's it sounds hokey and it sounds cheesy but i swear it's true it's like you just get this energy where it's just like okay well let's go you know I'm, i'm ready to do whatever i need to do and with this book you know, this this book was written entirely on an iPhone. Mm. Uh, it was there was no computer involved. Uh, you know, it was I com- I completely rewrote it eight times from start to finish. 
it went through six full editing cycles. And an editing cycle, for those that don't know, is where I will submit it to an, et to an editor. They will go through it and they will give it back to me, and then I will go through it, and then I will go and make the corrections and give it back to her, or just lather, rinse, repeat. Did that six times. So, and then of course, it was rejected 138 times. So, what was funny was that, you know, even throughout that process, I would see her picture, and it's just like, you know, I'm, I'm gonna keep going, I'm gonna keep doing this. Yeah. Um, the great thing was that even with the, the last, I had one review that really was not that good. Luckily, the overwhelming majority of the reviews were, were very good. But as with anything else, not everybody's going to like it. Exactly. You know, the last words they, they said was, yeah, the last thing they told me was that this book will not be popular. So the funny thing was a week later, it won its first award. And then a month later, it won six more. And then more and more people came back and said it was great. And it started becoming critically acclaimed. So it just, to me, it was just like, I always knew this, this, I was sitting on gold here, uh, so to speak, because it was, it was such a beautiful story and, and you don't, you don't read about books like this anymore. You don't see books like this anymore. So, and, and sure enough, I was right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's very real because it is real. It touches your heart because you put your heart into it. And that certainly flows through every page you have written. Just out of curiosity, were you able to make amends with your parents? Uh, my father, well, I'm not going to say anything because that's in the second book. Mm -hmm. um, my mother, we had a very strenuous relationship. She died back in July. Mm. Uh, it was just, it was one of those things where even to the day she died, she was still determined to believe that I was going to be just like my dad, even though my, my wife actually sat her down and told her, he's never hit me. He's never raised a hand against me at all. And he's never hit the kids. What is your problem? Right. So, and, my mother could never could never really explain it. It's just I think with my father, she he he beat her so badly and so often that she just lost faith in men and, and in love and everything else. And, you know, it was very she she was never able to alter her course, which is one of the reasons why I'm I'm very determined to do to alter my course as much as possible and make sure that the future we have is way better than our past. Absolutely. Well, you certainly have done that. Where can folks buy your book? Well, it's on Amazon.com as well as BarnesandNoble.com and pretty much where any online book retailers exist. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, I got my copy on Amazon. I suggest to the folks at home, they download, download a copy as well or get the physical copy, of course, which is great to have in your hand. You might want to reread this book, particularly if you had troubles growing up and really who hasn't had some kind of problem growing up. You learn how to find the fortitude within you to resist it all. The name of the book is called Destiny Lives on Fairhaven Street, a father's memoir of first love, sacrifice, and perseverance. It is written by C.J. Hudson, and we were delighted to have him as a guest here today on Spotlight. C.J., thank you so much for your time. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the opportunity. My pleasure. And to the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time on Spotlight.